Uh, um, Susan, if you should I just talk? This yeah, is probably I, the way I'm mm. going to be talking about this level. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. About like this. We can get you a job on Sesame Street. Oh, <laughs> I can do my ABCs too if you like. Okay. Okay. Uh, ABC. No. <laughs> the musical version. Ah, uh, hi there. Yeah. So now uh, so there, uh, there isn't a soundtrack album. No, we were going to do one, uh -huh. and basically what happened was the movie opened before it, it came together. Uh -huh. A thing called I think it was Gem Records that was going to put it out. Really, uh, the guys who did music for my film w w are on Gem. Really? And Who's that? Uh, uh, a band called Neva. 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 They're a new band. Um, and also Regina Richards and Red Hot, they were on A and M. Kind of like a Shirelles kind of kind of group, but we were we, we have a lot of original music. That we really wanted to, to try to do. I I know nothing about the music business, uh -huh. so kind of trying to find trying to find the right people to. Yeah. Do you have a soundtrack album? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it was privately pressed, but yeah. I want it's just not. Uh, Is it doing any? It really, we literally did like 400 copies, and uh -huh. so I'm trying to get get a distributor involved who will let us remix and do some stuff. Yeah. Did it really? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Susan, what prompted you to make Smithereens? Well, um, I had made three short films before doing Smithereens, and the first one was about a half hour in length, and uh, each one was getting a little longer than the one before, and then sometime in around, I guess, 1979. I decided I wanted to attempt to make a feature, and I was living in the village at that time, and I noticed that there was kind of a new group of people who had moved into the East Village somewhere around the later part of the 70s, and, uh, and that kind of fascinated me, and I decided that, that I wanted to make a film about that milieu. Um, you, you're talking about really the, the musical scene? Well, I think a lot of it came, f originated from the music. Um, it's funny because I went to NYU, the Graduate Film School, and I started there sometime around 70, f I was there from about 74 to 76, at a time when the East Village in New York was really dead. Uh, the kind of hippies from the 60s had moved out and there was nothing really happening. And But somewhere around 1976, um, my last year of film school, you saw the neighborhood beginning to change a little bit. And there was a new burst of, of energy and a lot of that was coming probably from the rock and roll movement. How did, how did the, the story and, and, and the screenplay evolve? Uh, well, um, it, it, I didn't really know what the story was going to be. I, um, basically, it's, I started with a character. I knew that there was a kind of person that I wanted to make a film about. And it's a character who I've known in various forms throughout my life. I'm sure there's a little bit of me in that character too, although it's not exactly autobiographical. But uh, it's a type of person, I mean, I think they take male and female forms, this kind of character, who, um, the kind of person who has a lot of energy, but sometimes doesn't really stop to think how really to channel that energy, but uh, uh, seems to always be running after something. And anyway, that, that kind of character intrigued me. And then once I knew the character that I wanted to make a film about, and knew I wanted to set her in a certain environment, like the East Village, um, the narrative developed out of the character. And in working with your co-author? Uh, uh, there were two people who were involved in the... Uh, Ron uh, Ron Nyswaner and another guy named Peter Askin. Um, basically, I mean, the, the way the script evolved was uh, over a period of about two years, I was writing notes to myself, you know, on the back of napkins and on scraps of index cards about this character, and, and I had images of my in my mind about the kinds of things she might do and um, bits of dialogue she might say, and, and I kept throwing these scraps of paper into a drawer, and after about two years, I realized that I had a drawer full of notes, and I sat down to try to write a screenplay based on all that information, and... Uh, and I was getting very confused. I was just too close to it. So basically what happened is I called in these, these two other writers and we just kind of shuffled, sorted through all these <laughs> notes to see what was really there. And, uh, <clears throat> and on the basis of working together and discussing it, we evolved, we figured out what the storyline was. 
How did you approach the the visual kind of qualities? What, what kind of visuals were you going for mm -hmm. in, in that kind of you know conception stage? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a pretty clear idea about what I wanted the film to look like. Um, I knew it was a film about pop culture, and in some ways the influences of pop culture on the, on the main character. So I knew I wanted to give the film a very pop look, almost a cartoon-like look at times. But I also wanted it to be gritty. So, so it was kind of, uh, I mean, the, the image that I had in my mind was like a street, a gritty street cartoon. And I think that a lot of the graphics have a very, I mean, a lot of the images have a very graphic look to them. Um, uh, cartoons, op, pop art, that kind of thing. So aside from the fact that it's a very low budget film that mm -hmm. has, has done extremely well uh, in New York and in Europe at the festivals, the Smithereens is, is kind of unique in that the main character, Ren, uh, is a female character, I think as Carrie Ricky pointed out in The Village Voice, uh, an, an anti-heroine who is allowed to make the same mistakes that men do. Mm -hmm. um, was this kind of like, you know, a conscious thing or was it, is it not something that, that overrides sex or? Um, well, I knew I wanted to make it, it, it's funny because most of the female characters you see are often, uh, you can put them into various kinds of categories, you know, the sex symbol, the maternal type, and um, I, I knew I wanted to make a character that would have a lot of energy and wouldn't, but wouldn't necessarily always be nice. And it's interesting because one of the things Carrie Rickey said is that, uh, I, I believe she said something like, she's, she makes the same mistakes that men make, and for someone you know, some strange reason, a lot of female characters aren't allowed to make those kinds of mistakes. I mean, um, for example, I, I don't think the, the character of Ren in some ways is similar maybe a little bit to Ratso Rizzo in Midnight Cowboy, not exactly, but, but she's a little manipulative and um, charming but also a liar. Hope, yeah. And I, I think that some people at first seeing the film maybe had a little trouble with seeing a woman who wasn't nice. And yet, uh, I think that, that that makes a real interesting character, that she doesn't necessarily have to always be nice. You know, she's, you know, she's a user that gets used, and she's a uh, very complex mm -hmm. character, obviously a very tough role to cast. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Susan Berman has, has made the character so incredibly appealing, uh, you know, despite yeah, the, yeah. the other thing. That how, did, how did you come to cast uh, Susan? Well, um, we put an ad originally in one of the trade papers, uh, backstage or show business, and we had no money to, to make the film with really. So we put this really horrendous ad, you know, no pay, no food, no sleep, and uh, I, I was shocked that anyone responded to it, but we must have gotten about a, a thousand photos and resumes, and we started auditioning people, and um, I knew that I wanted somebody who seemed real, uh, like a street person, but also I knew I needed a professional actress. And a lot of the people that we auditioned, um, although they might have been good actresses, they didn't have that street quality I was looking for. And as I said, we must have auditioned um, 75 to 100 people and didn't find anyone who had the right mix. And a, f uh, a guy named Yossi Siegel, who was the assistant director, happened to uh, go to an off off Broadway play one night and saw Susan Berman just sitting in the audience and uh, liked the way she looked and walked over to her and I think asked her, you know, told her about this audition and, and as a, a, an after the fact type thing, he just said, oh, by the way, are you an actress? I don't think he even knew she was at the time. And anyway, when she came in, she just seemed to, I just knew she was right. How would you describe your working relationship uh, with her? Ah, uh, I'll I should let her answer that. No, I I think we worked really well together. I mean, it was it was difficult because in the beginning because, you know, I mean, I, I think you get very close to the people that you work with, and like all marriages of sorts, you know, when you're really close to somebody, you fight, you love them, and you hate them, and so you're always sort of battling. But I think that that sometimes out of those um, knocking heads together, uh, some real interesting stuff happens because I think it's interesting that the character was one thing on paper and I think when Susan Berman was cast in the part the, the character took on a totally different dimension which I think was made the character very real. 
Now, um, some of the, the other characters in the film, Brad Wren mm -hmm. plays the, uh, the boy from Montana. Right. Uh, where did you find him? Again, uh, it was interesting because um, we were looking at the, the character that Brad plays is supposed to be this somewhat naive, optimistic guy from Montana who's traveled in a van to New York. Um, and I was looking for somebody who seemed naively, uh, who seemed Midwestern like they had just arrived in New York. And we auditioned a lot of actors who were originally from the Midwest, but for some reason after living in New York for a little while, they, they seemed very cosmopolitan, and we couldn't find somebody who seemed authentically naive. And uh, again, the same guy, Yossi Siegel, um, was walking uh, through, I guess it was Washington Square Park or some park in the village, and saw this kid, this tall kid, sitting on a park bench, reading an acting book, and walked over to him and invited him to an audition, and uh, that was Brad, and when I saw him, he was exactly the character I was looking for. And Richard Hell. Uh. Well, uh, Richard wasn't originally cast in that role. Originally we had another actor. That, that, that character was a little different in the original screenplay. And, um, and it, because of various production problems, one of them being Susan Berman broke her leg in the middle of the shooting and we had to stop filming for four months. Um, we decided to rethink, w we rewrote the script essentially at that point, and uh, at that time we started rethinking that the Eric, or the rock star character, and somebody said, well, um, we were throwing out names of people that the character of Ren would probably be attracted to, and one of them was Richard Hell. And so somebody said, well, why don't you just ask Richard Hell if he'd like to be in a film? And so we called him up and sent him the script. So uh, he had not acted before then? I think he had been in a, f a film once before, a film called Blank Generation, which was never released in this country. And I think he, he always liked film and has, you know, wants to be an actor. And so he, I think, was real excited about the opportunity to work. You, you know, most low-budget productions are problem-ridden just by the very fact that they are low-budget. Mm -hmm. What would you say was maybe your, your biggest problem uh, in, in shooting? Well, I think the fact that uh, with Smithereens, I think one of the big problems was because of Susan Berman's broken leg, um, the, the shooting was spaced out over a period of a year and trying to hold together a group of 20 people, cast and crew, over a year span of time when no one's getting paid and you're working under horrendous conditions a lot of the time, you know, long hours, uh, working in really dingy surroundings sometimes. Um, it gets real hard to, <laughs> to keep everyone together, but I think that to the credit of everyone, you know, everyone involved that there was this overriding belief in the project. How much did the film cost? Um, for the 16 millimeter version, it cost 80,000, mm -hmm. and then another about 20, 25 to blow it up to 35. How did you make that money stretch over such a long period of time? Uh, well, originally I started the film with $25,000, and I thought I could shoot the whole thing for $25,000. It was supposed to be a five week shoot, and after the end of the second week, we had already used up about 18,000, and that's when Susan broke her leg. At the time, I thought it was a disaster, but the advantage of having her, of, of her having broken her leg at that time was that I was able to kind of relearn or, or learn what it, what's involved to make a feature film because I was pretty naive to it all at the time. And I was also able to raise a lot of money, additional money. Um, and at that time, I did have some footage in the can, so it was easier to raise money once I could show people footage. In, in shooting in, in the streets, uh, yeah. you know, the film is that all, that's all street quality. Um, how was that experience, uh, sh shooting around, around town? Um, at times it was really fun because some unexpe unexpected things could happen in the background that sometimes were pretty interesting. At times it was a pain in the neck because one of the things, not only did you have to constantly be aware of what the actors were doing and, and all that other kind of stuff, but you had to be you know, I was always nervous that some jerk walking down the sidewalk wouldn't, you know, look in the camera and wave to his mother or mm -hmm. girlfriend. And, you know, often that did happen. Steal equipment. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, you know, people coming by with uh, 
big radios in the middle of a great take suddenly the sound would be ruined because you know some disco stuff was blaring in the background how about shooting on the subway for example well um what happened with that was i knew i needed to shoot in the subway for one or two days and um when I called up the subway, the MTA, to get permission, I was told that I needed something like a half a million dollars worth of insurance to shoot. Essentially, that mean it would would have come down to about a, a thousand or two thousand dollars to get a half a million dollars worth of insurance. But when you're working with eighty thousand dollar budget, there's no way you can put out two thousand dollars for insurance. Uh, so essentially we were told we weren't allowed to shoot on the subway and yet I knew I needed it. So what happened was we went down with about five people, two actors, um, the cameraman, the assistant cameraman and myself, and we just snuck into the subway at about 12 o'clock, you know, midnight. It was a Memorial Day uh, weekend and just rode the subway trains the entire night for two nights. Um, Stealing a shot here, stealing a shot there. Did you have a lot of that kind of, you know, winging it, kind of stealing locations? Oh yeah, you know? absolutely. And you know, I mean, the, the problem with that is, there's always you're always nervous about continuity because you know you're shooting part of it, stealing a shot one day, and then you go back the next day to finish it, and suddenly everything's all different. And uh, so actually, if you watch the film, you probably notice a lot of continuity <laughs> mistakes. Hopefully, not too many. And uh, when you. We're finished shooting. Yeah. Um, you edited the film yourself. Yeah. Um, how, did, when did, at what point did you bring in the, your musicians, uh, the guys from the Feelies? Yeah. Um, that wasn't until I had what I thought was a fine cut. I found out afterwards that what I thought was a fine cut was still about 20 minutes away from actually being a fine cut. Um, uh, basically, I thought I had finished the film, and I brought them in to just do the background music. And uh, at that time, the film was about two hours long. And I sat down with a. Uh, I remember one night I was in the editing room, and, and another director, a guy named Jonathan Demi, came in with a friend of mine and sat down and watched the film. And uh, it was real interesting. He made some very good comments, but what what I found real interesting was watching it with somebody who I respected sitting behind me. I could feel myself squirming at different parts, and or like you know wanting to speed up the the editing machine. And judging by my own body reactions, I could tell. I mean that that to me was a signal of of where I should start chopping. And uh, anyway, after he left. Um, about a week, you know, I, I chopped out an additional about 15 to 20 minutes the following week, and, and that was what the finished version turned And then, out to be. then you brought the guys in to, to score? They, they had already, at that point, they were already, had started um, scoring it. I mean, basically, what we did is I gave, I gave them a video copy of the film, and then they brought that to their studio, and they just played around with different things. And yeah, and then w when the film was recut, I was able to sort of edit out sections of their music to, to you know, fit the new version. You know, the film was in the can. Uh, what was your next step? Well, what, once I got a print, an answer print. Yeah, well, it, it's funny because things happened rather quickly at that stage. It took me two years to get it into the can, but once it was in the can, in fact, I, uh, the, I saw an answer print at the lab, and the next day um, I brought it to a screening room where the, the guy from the director's fortnight at the Cannes Film Festival was scheduled to look at it. And uh, he looked at it. I had never really shown it to anyone outside of a few actors who had worked on the film, so I had no real feedback. And so I, I didn't know what to expect, and I, and I brought it over to the screening room where this gentleman saw it. I, I assume he saw it the next day because that following day I got a phone call and my a message on my answering machine that he would like to meet me for breakfast. I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I got real nervous, but uh, I didn't know what to expect. Anyway, I met him for, bre for breakfast and essentially what he told me was that he liked the film very much and he was considering putting it in the director's fortnight at the Cannes Film Festival. I didn't know at the time what that meant. I mean, I, I sort of had applied to the Cannes Film Festival just a because I figured I'd send an application form away and I'd waste a dollar on an airmail stamp, and I didn't really know what it meant, you know. And um, anyway, as he was telling me that he liked the film and he w was considering putting it in the festival, he, he said that he needed a 
but he couldn't do that unless I had a 35 millimeter print. He couldn't show it in 16. And at that time, the film was only in 16 millimeter, and I need, I didn't, I was totally broke. I didn't have another twenty thousand dollars to blow it up. And as it turned out, as I was telling him that I'm really sorry, I just don't have any money, and he was saying, well, you know, maybe some other time. Um, it just so happened that sitting about a table away from us. At the end of our conversation, he looked over and sitting a table away from us was this guy who was the head of, of Janus Films, sitting with this woman, Joy Perrith, who's a um, foreign sales agent. And they were having breakfast with another film director, a guy named Victor Nunez, who did this film, Gal Young, and they were talking to him about something. So the guy from the director's sport and I called him, um, the man from Janus Films over, said something in French, turned to me and said, would you mind showing them your film tomorrow? You know, I said, well, why not? And the next day they saw the film, and about four days later I got a phone call from Joy Perrith saying that she would lend me $25,000, and that kind of guaranteed that it would be in the director's fortnight, which was real nice. But then to what was even more shocking was about a week later I got a phone call from Paris saying that a guy named Gilles Jacob, who was the head of the entire Cannes Film Festival, was going to be in New York wanted to see the film, he did, and uh, asked me if he could take it out of the director's fortnight and move, in move it into the main competition. And anyway, that's how it all <laughs> evolved. Now, and then at what point did you get, get a distributor? Well, once it was in the, director, uh, in the main competition, suddenly um, getting distribution was a lot easier because the film was so different from the other films in the main competition, it, it got it. it pretty good amount of attention in France. And so uh, rather than ha having to hustle to, to find a distributor, they were coming to, to us, <laughs> which was real surprising. And New Line Cinema released the film here? No, basically what happened is around the time, before it was accepted into the director's fortnight, sort of simultaneously, when it was still in 16 millimeter, I had shown it to the people at, at uh, New Line Cinema. and. I had heard from Sarah Risher that she liked it, but they weren't willing to put money into blowing it up. So I have a feeling they were kind of going to release it on the college market in 16 millimeter version. Anyway, s before they had made their final decision and before I had agreed to go with New Line Cinema, that's when I heard the news that it was going to be in the Cannes Film Festival and that not only was it going to be in the director's fortnight, but it was going to be in the main competition. And at that point, we kind of withdrew it from New Line Cinema had it blown up to 35, and then they came back to us at Cannes and certainly made a better offer. And then they opened the film here at the Waverly, and yeah. it, it broke the house record there, didn't it? It, di it did well at the Waverly, yeah. It, uh, it, it ran there for about three months. And uh, it, it's, it did, it's been doing pretty well. It, it opened in LA and San Francisco and Boston, and I think because the reviews in New York were pretty good, uh, that kind of generated a, a sort of cult-like interest in the film. And this might be hard for you to answer because you're obviously so close to the film, but why do you think that it's, it's been so successful uh, in, in, in the theaters? Um, I, well, I think one thing that peop people have responded pretty well to it because I think, I think people are getting sick of these overproduced you know, $40 million Hollywood uh, extravaganzas. You know, I mean, I, I think, well, th this year, this winter, I, I guess there's been a, a bunch of successful big Hollywood films like Sophie's Choice and Tootsie and stuff. But before that point, I mean, there were a lot of big flops. And I think that, th that audiences were getting real fed up with being served that kind of, you know, it's like pablum, like expensive baby food and, uh, and I think that the fact that, that Smithereens hopefully is, is, tries to be sort of honest about the subject matter it's dealing with, and, and also it's cheap, <laughs> you know? And I think people respond to the grittiness of it. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, thematically, um, both the Australian film Starstruck mm -hmm. and the Scorsese film King of Comedy mm -hmm. uh, and Smithereens all have something in common in that they're all about an unknown trying to, to be famous, uh, now, whereas Starstruck and King of Comedy are yeah. highly stylized. In fact, even in terms of fantasy, in, in, in many yeah. cases, in both those films, Smithereens is you know almost ultra realistic in in comparison. Um, you know, I think that that people maybe 
you know, want that that kind of realism mm -hmm. somehow? Um, I, well, yeah, I think I think people want characters that they can identify, or you know, that that they recognize, you know, whether in themselves or in other people that they've known. And I think that that although, as I said before, Rin is not necessarily a nice character, I think she is a real character and she's a recognizable character. I mean, I know a lot of people who have seen the film that come out saying, yeah, I, I know somebody like that or I've known somebody like that. What are you working on next? Um, well, right now I'm working on this, I'm work I'll be working with a writer actually starting next week on a film um, about the, it, it's sort of a female buddy-buddy film kind of um, set in the early 60s, and it's about girl groups, um, sort of girl groups meaning like the Shangri-Las, the Ronettes, the, uh, I mean essentially, <laughs> it, it's sort of about three white girls from Queens who are friends and who sing together. And, um, and basically the reason that they sing is because it's kind of an escape for them from the somewhat, um, the ordinary or the drudgery of their uh, everyday lives. Is it a contemporary piece? It, it, no, it's set in 1963, 1964. I mean, if I had to describe it in crude terms, I'd say it's a cross between like a female diner and a white dream girls, if that, you know, means anything. It, being a woman in the business, mm -hmm. has that, uh, you know, have you run into any, any kind of, uh, you know, difficulty yeah. because you're a woman in, in, in the film business? Well, working independently, no, I don't think, I don't think I have. Basically, because when you work independently, you have to generate your own work. So, I, I choose to work with people who, who I think are, are pretty open-minded, and you know, in in that regard, I think trying to work and the more I have dealings with the industry, I think the more that becomes an issue. Have you? You've been talking to studios, you know, to the majors uh, about projects. Yeah, I, I have, and um, um, so far they've been pretty nice. Um, I'm a little skeptical about working with the studios. Um, it would be nice to be able to work with more money. It would be nice to be able to pay myself. But on the other hand, I'm sure there's trade-offs. So you always have to ask yourself, what are you giving up? Uh, I, I think one of the problems and one of the fears that I have is that as a woman working with the studios, there's so few female directors that often as a woman, you know, you do something independently that receives some amount of success and then you get your shot to work with the big boys and if you um, blow it, you don't get a second shot, you know. I mean, there's been a lot of women who did something independently, then they make one studio film and then you never hear, you know, from them again. And I love film too much to make one more, you know, I'd like to make more than one more film in, in my life. And, and that's an awful way to, to be thinking about, you know, that if you don't pull this next one off, that, that may be the end of a, of a career, it, a studio career anyway. Um, you know, w which I think is somewhat unfair because there are a lot of male directors who for, you know, make kind of mediocre film after mediocre film, but you know, maybe they're p part of this boys club and somehow they're able to continue working. Um, but, but that's certainly something that I am aware of that um, affects any judgment that I'll make in the future. You know, there's, a, there's a whole group of, of New York independent filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, uh, such as Jim Jarma, Seamus Poe, Scott B. and Beth B. yourself. Um, and really Smithereens t to me seems in many ways a breakthrough film for uh, what y one can loosely categorize as a New York independent feature filmmaking uh, scene. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many of the other films have not had that kind of broad-based audience that that some of the means, you know, seems to be you know snowballing I I into into getting. Um, can you comment on 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 that scene of that film filmmaking thing? Um. Why I don't want I don't can't comment on why this and why not mm -hmm. some other but um, I I think that there's that over the last couple of years that there has been a real energy in, in, in terms of the New York independent film community. It's interesting because I just came back from a festival about uh, about a month ago in Seville, Spain, where they had a 
a category called New York Independence, um, and they had about 13 films there. And it was odd how in Spain and in Europe, New York, uh, what do they call it? New York New Wave films or something, seemed to be much more of a force than they are here in New York, or it seemed to be much more of a co cohesive group. Um, I think one of the problems w with getting, you know, fortunately for Smithereens, it was able to get a, a relatively commercial distribution. I think the problem with some of the other films is that it's it's the distribution. You know, often they play in cinemas that don't get a wider audience, or they play in, um, you know, midnight shows, weekends, or something like that. And unfortunately, the people who control the distribution also determine the taste, you know, so so there may be some of those films that could appeal to a wider audience if they could find distributors who would bank on them. So to, just to talk a minute about uh, some of the other artists uh, in, involved with, with, with Smithereens, um, your cameraman? A guy named Shreeno Kadim, um, who actually has worked, well, he, I worked with him on, on two other short films, and he also worked with Amos Poe. Uh, on a film called Farner. And your production designer? Franz Harland, um, who has a video production company and does a lot of rock videotapes and stuff. I remember reading that so he was an assistant to Otto Preminger. Otto Preminger, yeah. I think he worked on um, uh, The Human Factor, I think it was called, which was Preminger's last film. <laughs> it deservedly so. Um, Tell us a little bit about your background in terms of you, you, where you grew up and, and your education and so forth. Yeah, um, I, well, I'm from Philadelphia originally. I went to school at a place called Drexel Institute of Technology, um, and which is sort of like a poor man's MIT. Um, basically, it was an engineering school, but they had a small school of design. Actually, I think it was called the School of Home Economics um, that had three categories, uh, nutrition, child psychology or something or household management and design and I was in the design school and um, the, the second year I was there they the first year was pretty much fine arts type uh, program but the second year they you had to pick a major uh, um, and I picked fashion design and then they quickly um, assign you to about eight hours a day worth of of sewing and tailoring classes. And I guess I was about 19 or 20 at the time, and I just couldn't see sitting behind a sewing machine for eight hours a day. So I quickly um, started cutting my classes and instead going to the movies. And I think it was somewhere around that time that I um, started taking movies a little, more, a little bit more seriously. Well, what kinds of films did you like? Yeah. Well, it's weird because I, I came from a, a kind of small suburb outside of Philadelphia where basically what I had grown up watching was the shopping mall variety of cinema. Um, you know, uh, I mean, when I was real young, it was kind of Haley Mills and Doris Day. And, uh, and I don't think I'd really seen too many foreign films until I, I, I hit college. And it was then that I started you know, as I said, cutting the, the sewing classes and um, hanging around the film department. They had a, a very, very small film department. And I think the first film that I saw was Godard's Breathless. And it was just so different from any film I had seen before that it just kind of, uh, uh, it, it just opened up a lot of thing, thoughts in my head. You know, I, I just, I, I hadn't known that that's what you could do with film, right? That, that that's the kind of movies one could make. And um, oh. uh, anyway, so uh, um, I, I started getting intrigued with cinema. And I, as, as I said, since my background had always been in graphics or visuals, and, and I also liked storytelling, it seemed like a natural move to go from design to, to film. And then NYU uh, grad school? Yeah. What was that, what was that like? Um, well, I guess I went to NYU. I started in NYU sometime around 19, I think it was around 1974. And um, I had never made a film before. I, I, I went to NYU. And um, basically what happened is the, the, the first year you sort of learn, you know, this is the editing machine, this is how the camera works, you know, just, just basic stuff. And then the second year you get to play around to make your first film. 
and first of all, sound, and I did, and the film turned out much better than I had anticipated. In fact, it, it, it got the um, Student Academy Awards, you know, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has this Student Academy Awards where all the, where all the film students across the nation compete in different categories. And uh, what was shocking to me was I, when, when I went to NYU, when I started there, I felt real inferior to everyone else in the class because they had been making films before and I really knew relatively nothing about it. And also, technically, I had very little experience. And what that, making that film showed me um, was that if you trust your gut feelings, that you'll learn the technical things along the way. That the most important thing is to kind of figure out what it is you want to say and listen to, you know, listen to your guts. Yeah, Susan, thanks a lot for being on the show, oh, and uh, continued good luck. Thank you. It's fun. Okay. I apologize. Oh, it's just here, and it slipped out, and then I had to try and get it out the second time. Oh, I, I just I, thought that it was off. That's I must tell I you something. This is a, you mentioned about your next film. My godmother, my aunt, uh, Rosie DeSantis, and her <coughs> two girlfriends from Bensonhurst from New Utrecht High School, in 1958 and 59, uh, they had a, a girl group called the Rosebuds, and they were on Dick Clark, and they had oh, really? they had three hits: um, uh, yeah, Dearest yeah. Darling, um, P.S. I Love You. The they P.S. I Love You, the one the Beatles then. That was the one the Beatles did later, but they they didn't write it, but they yeah. had a hit with yeah. it, and they were on Bandstand. Uh, they were really yeah, big in Philly. And then, and they were signed. They were on ABC Paramount. They were, you know, it's three three Italian girls from from Bensonhurst, and then they decided they would rather get married and raise kids. And <laughs> oh, I would love to talk to your aunt. Really? Or your, I mean, your uh, godmother. Yeah, they. <laughs> it's interesting because they, a couple of years ago, the three of them, after you know, all three of them raised all raised kids. Uh -huh. You know, uh, and and they. Um, got back together and they started doing these rock r revivals. Really? And it's, yeah, it's just, uh, she's yeah. A, I mean, she's a bit much. I mean, <laughs> she's like still a star, but, but, uh, but it, yeah, it would be very good for you to talk to her. I mean. Because what this is basically, I mean, the story, it's not about the Shangri-La, it's, mm -hmm. it's not supposed to be about the Shangri-La's, but it is kind of about three girls from Cambria, Cambria Heights, Queens, uh -huh, uh -huh. who uh, are sort of, you know, I mean, they're they're not bad girls, bad bad girls. They're good bad girls. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're real people. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And it's also about sort of the Brill Building, which is. Mm. Action. Susan. Well, <laughs> well, really, don't. Well, I, I think so. Yeah. Well, define. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not needing to double you. Well, you know, I'm not. Who's the junior? Ready? Oh yeah. Any, anytime you're ready. Yes, we do. Check that. I just want to get one shot where I reveal a lamp. How's that grab you? <laughs> How dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> it's called motivation. Okay. Susan, in Smithereens, you have the leading role uh, of Wren. Um, yeah. Do you know any girls like Wren? Um, I, I do. I mean, I've seen a lot of people like Wren, you know, for one thing. I mean, I've when I first came to New York from California, I lived in the East Village, so I was around that area a lot, and so I'd seen people. But I think that uh, I've known, you know, I've had a lot of friends that have been like Ren in different ways, and I sort of felt as if I, you know, was being influenced by people I had known or things that I'd experienced in, you know, portraying that character. So that all helped in preparing for the for the part. Yeah. When you came to New York from California, uh, how, how old were you? I was 21. And what? How did it all, was it your first time in, in, in Manhattan? It was my first, well I had been here for a vacation, but it was something that I just wanted to do all my life, and I didn't really know why. 
And I mean, I can sort of understand the way Ren felt in a way because I just wanted to leave the way that I, I didn't want to live at all the way I'd been, you know, the way I'd grown up. I just wanted something different, but I didn't know what I was going to. I and mean, I sort of had an idea that I wanted to be a lawyer. And that's what I, you know, I thought, well, because my parents were actors and I figured, well, just like most kids do, not what their parents do, I thought I'd become a lawyer. So I came to New York just kind of thinking I would do that and just wanting to be there. You know, just I wanted to live there without really knowing why. It was just the place I always dreamed of. So that's why I came. What kind of, uh, you know, struck you about New York as coming from California? I think, you know what, I think it was a lot of um, movies I had seen about New York might have had a lot to do with it. Um, I was real drawn to kind of uh, New York, to, like I used to love like old John Garfield movies and things like that. And I guess I had this idea that, you know, there was something about the energy of New York that I knew I would, I knew I'd feel at home there. I mean, I really had the feeling that I would. And it was true when I, when I first got here, I didn't know a soul and I was terrified. And it was the coldest winter in a hundred years and I'd never seen snowfall, but I just felt like it was familiar for some reason, you know. In playing Ren, you know, the, the character is, it would seem on paper, not a, a very likable character and certainly, you know, with, with traits that are, well, you know, almost despicable, yet yeah. the character a, as you play it is, you know, is is just very, very appealing and, and it seems, you know, a very fine line, uh, you know, with the character. H how did you approach it? Uh, well, um, I guess, you know, the thing is that she does a lot of things uh, that aren't very nice. Uh, you know, I think that she's definitely in the generation of the 80s, you know, and unlike, you know, people from the generation before that, say, lived through the 60s and had experienced a different way of, you know, dealing with people, this generation is ki doesn't have that sort of thing to fall back on. It's, you know, I think that sort of the big manipulators, you know, the people that get ahead are sort of the models for a lot of kids. And the thing about Ren is that she, s she wants to get ahead. She has no idea what it is she wants to do and she wants to, she's sort of imitating the manipulators. She just doesn't know how to do it right. So she ends up putting herself in awkward situations all the time. But, you know, I, I think that under, in every scene, underneath her actions, what she's doing, there's, you know, there's something else. I mean, there's a certain kind of, hopefully, you know, vulnerability and, um, you know, fear. She wants something, you know. I think she desperately wants something. And um, whether it's, you know, love or whether it's wanting to be larger than life or just wanting to, you know, really wanting to survive and wanting to live a life that's dynamic and completely the opposite from the way that her parents and her sister live. But I think that, you know, she's a kid, you know. She's, she's 18, 19 years old. And I think that she's got all the, you know, sort of feelings that a kid has of, you know, being confused, being scared, and they all come, they're all sort of underneath the bravado and everything. Kind of like a lot of misspent energy. Yeah. I mean, I remember how I felt when I first came to New York. I wanted to, you know, I sort of, I wanted to be impenetrable. I wanted to seem like I'd been there all along. Inside, I was terrified, you know, but on the outside, I was just trying very hard to, you know, be a certain way. If you could kind of conjecture as to where the character of Ren is going, what would you what would you say? Um, you mean where in her later years? What yeah, she would say do? after the film. I don't really know. I mean, I think that you know, the film ends with a question. You don't really know where she's going to go, but I think she changes at the end. I mean, you know, throughout the whole film, she's always saying, uh, you know, I've got a million and one places to go. And she doesn't really listen to anybody because she's so like driven this way that she doesn't, you know, leave room for what anybody might, you know, any comments people have about her life. And at the end of the film, when she really has, she's really has nowhere left to go. Um, when she's walking down the highway and a complete stranger stops and tries to pick her up and she's ignoring him. And then he says, do you have any place better to spend your time? And I think for the first time, she kind of listens and you know and sort of realizes that she doesn't so I don't know what's gonna happen to her but I think at least she's realized where she is you know and that's a start I mean I'd hate to think that she's gonna go on from there to you know become a go to some sort of technical career institute or something like that but I think that she's sort of uh, realizing something about herself how did uh, the director Susan Seidelman guide you through the performance um, well we really, uh, we rehearsed a lot and we talked about the character a lot. I mean, I'd go over there and we'd have, we'd talk for a couple of hours just about who she was 
and you know, very detailed kind of way. And we did a lot of improvisations where a lot of things were kind of brought out. And um, you know, she would pick up on certain things that, I mean, she had a lot of suggestions to make. And you know, sort of together we came to who this person was. And we, and but it was good, you know, like as Susan said, it was the, it was all sort of done in stages because I fell and broke my ankle. So it was every time we came back and started shooting again, we felt stronger about it, and it sort of there was a momentum that that happened. How did that happen? How did you break your break your ankle? We were there was another character. Richard Hell character didn't exist in the first script, so there was another man who was supposed to live in a loft in Soho, and he was really the kind of person that Ren would never be attracted to. But um, we were over there doing a doing improvisations. I just met the guy. It was the first day that I'd met him, and it was one of these things where. Basically, I wanted to stay, and he wanted me to leave, and that was the situation. And then we just improvise on that, and um, so he picked me up and carried me out and put me on the fire escape, and you know, closed all the windows, and I just sort of took a step back into space. <laughs> That's so it all happened sort of during an improvisation. It was sort of strange. But how did you feel? I mean, was it kind of everything had to stop. I felt terrible. You know, I really felt. I thought, oh God, I've really blown it now. You know, and uh, it turned out though to be a real good thing. Because the, the whole script, you know, was changed. And the character of Ren made a lot more sense to me because I understood why she'd be attracted to, you know, the people she was attracted to. They each had, had two very different things that she needed, you know. This other guy, it was really, I was trying my best to conjure up something, but I didn't know how. Any incidents during the shooting that uh, you might relate that were anything out of the ordinary in terms of, uh, there's, a, there's a scene, for example, when, when Ren is getting thrown out of the apartment and you know, there's a crowd gathering. Uh -huh. What's going on there? I mean, where, where I get dumped on the head. That was actually that was the first day of shooting. So it was that was great. There was a whole group of people in the you know, in the street, and uh, you know we were shooting in the Lower East Side, way east. And uh, you know, I mean, they were all there, and they were all yelling and screaming. And at first, it, we thought that we were going to have to redub the whole thing, but we just left it in, and I think it's sort of great. I mean, there's you know definitely. There were no more people out on the street than there usually are, and they would certainly react to something like that. So I think it's, you know, I mean, there were all sorts of crazy things that happened. I mean, we would shoot in locations that, you know, where people just wouldn't. Uh, we were once shooting in front of a palmistry place, and this woman like didn't want us to be there because she thought we were going to ruin business for us. So she kept insist. She kept walking into the middle of the shot, you know, and she would just be there in the middle of the scene, and we finally had to, you know. I don't remember if we moved or paid her off, but it was, you know, it was really crazy. It's a very physical part, too. You really get, get knocked around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, she certainly gets brutalized a lot. And, uh, you know, I mean, she is sort of like, uh, you know, this... I know that Susan described her this way once as being sort of this little wind-up toy that bumps into walls and gets knocked around a lot and sort of, you know, just bounces right back and keeps going. It's like getting knocked down and like, all right, get, all right, get up and keep going and not stop to think about how hurt you are. The, the, the whole ethos of, of Jersey, you know, New Jersey, the, the girl from New Jersey comes to, comes to the big city to, well, shoot, yeah. to make it with the, with the rock stars and, and be the groupie and everything. I think it's sort of, you know, living in a sort of a suburban area that's right in the shadow of a huge city like that. I think, I mean, I grew up in Van Nuys in the valley, which is, you know, right near L.A. And, you know, everybody wanted to be a rock star. Everybody wanted to, you know, go to be a movie star, you know, sort of in the shadow of Hollywood. And when there's that, like, other thing over the hill. And, I, and I, you know, with New York, it's ten times as much because it's a real city. Ren almost seems like the, new, like the correlative the, for New York of, of a valley girl in some ways. You think so? <laughs> so that, the, whole, the whole stereotype playing against each other. Yeah. Kind of growing, now growing up in California, obviously you were very exposed to the movies. Your parents mm -hmm. were actors. Um, at what point did really you, you didn't really want to be an actress until you came to New York? Well, I really did when I was younger. I mean, I really, you know, I, I went to you know acting classes for teenagers and stuff like that. And I, I thought, well, this is what I want to do. And then, uh, and then I just, you know, I guess my parents. They really loved what they did, but they, you know, I, there were never any illusions about it. And I always sort of got the feeling that it was a, you know, it was a rotten, that, I mean, not rotten, but it could be fickle, you know, that sort of life, that it wasn't necessarily, didn't keep going the way you wanted it to and it could suddenly stop abruptly your work. And 
I guess maybe that had some sort of influence on it. Also, I just, I wanted to do something, you know, I was just, I guess, rebelling, but in another kind of way. And I wanted to, you know, do this lawyer sort of work. And I worked with the farm workers, at, with Chavez for a while, and did some work that I thought was real exciting. And I thought, well, this is what being a lawyer is like. I mean, there was all sorts of things going on. I had a lot of responsibility, which anybody did there because they needed people. It was strikes going on and everything. But then I started doing some legal work, and I just, it wasn't interesting. So I just sort of fell back into acting. And uh, you, you've had you've a lot of uh, stage experience. Yeah, I've done some stuff here. I worked, um, I did a couple of shows at the Public Theater, one of them in Central Park. And the last one um, was a musical, The Death of Von Richthofen at the Public, and that was really great. It was really fun. What kind of, of parts are they? Because, you know, probably most you know, viewers would, you know, kind of identify you, associate you with, with the one part in Smithereens. Well, the first, uh, well, the first show I did in New York was Rebel Without a Cause. I played a, a girl in a gang. But then I did, uh, in the park, I was in Henry the Fourth Part One, and I played the Welsh princess. And sp I had to speak in Welsh and, you know, sing a song. And it was pretty far removed from Wren, that's for sure. Do you have any apprehensions about, you know, or fears of kind of getting typed as that, uh, in that part? Um, I, not really. I mean, I real I, you know, sometimes I, I find that I'm going up for things that are, you know, much younger than me, you know, and that's sort of interesting. And uh, I've, I've talked to, the things that I've been sort of called into audition for aren't necessarily like Wren, you know. I think that there's, most of them are younger, you know, of her sort of generation, but I haven't really found that true yet. You know, maybe I will, but I haven't yet. Do, do you get recognized on the street? No, I don't, because I don't, I don't really look that much like I did in the film, I guess. I mean, I remember once we were watching it, and there was a guy that was screening it, a projectionist, and after it was over, he turned to me and he said, so were you involved in this in any way? And I said, yeah, I was in it. And he said, who'd you play? And I said, well, and, you know, people just don't, uh, don't recognize me. How was it for you uh, working with Richard Hell? It was, it was good. I mean, we, we had a real good, you know, we had a good time together. It's funny because it got really much more um, relaxed as it went along. He uh, was working on his album, and I think the whole thing was probably because he was doing that also, and his focus was maybe somewhere else. It, he became a lot more relaxed, and we, you know. But we, you know, I I thought he was he was great. I mean, he was. It felt like the real thing. It's interesting because you know you're from L.A. and you're you're playing a character, you know, from Jersey comes to New York and wants to go to L.A. And it's kind of. Yeah. It was paralleling there. Yeah, well, I guess it's sort of the way I felt coming to New York, you know. I mean, I had an idea of, I used to dream about it at night, and I know what it's like to have this far-off place that you've never been to, but you just know that's where it's going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. For you, what would you say uh, would be the, you know, the major differences in terms of working on film and working on the stage, in terms of you, the kind of preparation and the mental thing that you have to go through? Well, it's much, you know, I mean, the difference is that I mean, one of the big differences is that, you know, in, in stage there's a momentum, that there's a build, and there's, you know, um, in film you can start shooting the end of the scene first and then do the beginning and do the most climactic scene, you know, first and then do the part that leads up to it. So it's a whole different kind of, uh, I guess, you know, your concentrate. And also there's a lot of waiting around, you know, and so you've, you're con you've got to really, I guess, have your concentration up all the time. So I guess, you know, for on filming, you really have to be able to turn on your, your, your emotions. I mean, almost like a faucet. M maybe nine times in a row also for the same thing. And it was, you know, it's, it's much different, you know. I wouldn't say it's more difficult, but it's certainly, you know, it's certainly a different kind of experience. That whole Lower East Side scene that the f in which the film takes place, um, what, what kind of familiarity did you, did you have w with it before the film? I'd live, I've, I actually still live there, and I lived there uh, for a few years. And when I first got to New York, that's where I stayed. That's where I first found a place to live and just sort of stayed in that area for, you know, about four years. So, and I came in 77. I came to New York in 77, and that's when, I guess, sort of things were just happening. I mean, CBGB, there was a lot of things going on there, and I, like, I saw there was something happening in, in this neighborhood that was nothing like I had ever experienced in L.A. or in San Francisco, where I'd lived also. And, um, you know, so I was definitely, I was there when it, but I was, I was never involved with it. I just sort of knew that something was sort of going on and there was a different kind of music and a different, people were dressing differently. And it was a whole, you know, scene starting. 
Could you tell the story of how you came to be cast in, in Smithereens? Well, I was, um, a f I was watching a friend of mine in a play in some little off-off-Broadway theater, and uh, somebody called me the next day, Yossi Siegel called me, and he said, I, were, you, were you the one that was wearing the bomber jacket? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, would you like to audition for a film? And I said, sure. And he said, oh, well, are, do you act? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, this is uh, the address. Send your picture and resume. So I did. And what was it when you kind of when you came into the into the production? What what did it see, What was it? What did it seem like you were kind of getting into? I didn't really. I guess to be honest, I thought because I had because I knew that in backstage there were so many ads for student films. I had the feeling that I was pro it was probably a student film. You know, I mean that was my first feeling that it was going to be something that was you know, you do it and maybe it would be screened for your friends and the director's friends and I thought well this, this would be a great thing to do you know I've never really done a film before and I really like to do something that you know there's not going to be a pressure of people seeing it in the theater or anything like that it's just going to be you know so that's kind of but I felt I mean there was a description of the character that was typed up and it was hanging on the wall and as soon as I saw that I just I was real interested how, how would you describe your feelings when you first saw the film in, in an audience with you know with that kind of immediate response right there well, I was, I saw a lot of rushes before that and I saw the rough cut and I saw it in several stages and I, I mean, it took me a long time to be able to watch the rushes with sound. I mean, sometimes I'd have to leave the room. It was just, you know, it was, <laughs> I was terrified. To see but um, by the time it got to the first public screening, I felt really good because I'd never, the audience was real responsive and um, there was a lot of people there and a lot of them were, they were friendly, you know, a lot, they were friends and so it was a good way to see it with sort of, you know, everything that could possibly be laughed at was being laughed at. And for the first time I thought, you know, I didn't cringe every time, you know, I said something. What kind of things are you working on now? I'm just working on trying to get more work. And uh, I, I just, you know, I want to, I'm just auditioning and just trying to, to get more, you know, get more work. What does that inv involve for, for a young actress in New York City these days? Well, it involves First of all, it's, I think it's real important to have an agent, and I didn't have one until just, you know, real recently. So now things are going to, you know, now I'm going to start auditioning a lot more. But if you don't have one, it's really hard because you don't know what's going on. You know, it, it's just, uh, that's the only way you have of knowing what's, what films are being done. Otherwise, you're just watching people that you know go up and, oh, I auditioned for this film. And you say, oh, gee, I wish I could have. But so now at least I'll have a chance to meet, you know, people and audition. How, how has stardom affected your life, Susan? Well, <laughs> it, I'll tell you. I don't, first of all, I don't feel like stardom or anything like that. I, I f one thing that the film has done, it's certainly given me a lot more confidence, definitely. And um, I feel like I've got something to show for myself, you know, that I, that, you know, I feel pretty good about, you know. I mean, it's hard to see yourself on film. Depending on what mood I'm in, I feel pretty good about it. But it's, it's just made me, you know, it's made me feel like, yeah, well, maybe I should keep, you know, maybe I should keep doing this and really try to give it a shot. Okay, I hope you do. I know a lot of people do, too. Oh. Okay, thanks for being on the show. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay? It's good. Okay. okay.